Hello, everyone, and welcome to Power Your Tribe with Christine Coma Ford. I'm Courtney Fisher from McGraw Hill. I'd like to start with a brief introduction of our author and thought leader, Christine Coma Ford. For over 30 years, leadership and culture coach, serial entrepreneur, and New York Times bestselling author, Christine Coma Ford, has helped leaders navigate growth and change. Her coaching, consulting, and strategies have created hundreds of billions of dollars in new revenue and company value for her clients. The neuroscience techniques she teaches are easy to learn and immediately applicable to help leaders see into their blind spots, expand their vision, and more effectively influence outcomes. Her latest book, Power Your Tribe, is a USA Today and Wall Street Journal bestseller. The book teaches you to release resistance to change, build more emotional agile teams, and mobilize the entire organization quickly and efficiently toward a clear and common goal. With Christine's guidance, you can lead your tribe through any challenge and ensure success for years to come. Before I pass it off, I'd like, you, I'd like to encourage you to submit questions into the Q&A section of your screen throughout the session. We will dedicate the last 15 minutes of the webinar to Christine answering your questions. There's also a comment box underneath the screen so you can participate throughout the webinar. And with that, here's Christine. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are based on the planet. I'm Christine Comerford, and I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. Today, we're gonna to talk about resilience. We're gonna talk about the ability to navigate change. So let's take just a second and pause for a moment. Here's the thing. Human beings are tremendously capable and actually tremendously naturally resilient. In my work with over a thousand different companies all over the world, all different sizes of organizations, what I found is one common thing. And that is that human beings will always go to the behavior that feels best. So when we look at all these different companies with all these different needs, let's think about what they have in common, human beings. You're going to learn three tools today that are going to help you discover why do people resist change and how to help them embrace it. You're going to understand why performance suffers in change scenarios and how to create high performance. You're also going to understand the recipe for emotional agility. And emotional agility really is our choice of how we want to behave, of how we want to feel. Because when we learn how to be emotionally agile, regardless of what's happening outside, we can choose how we respond to it inside. So when we look at the resilience cycle from releasing resilience to increasing rapport with ourselves, making new meaning, anchoring the outcome we want, kind of engaging and enrolling our tribe members, et cetera, today you're gonna to learn tools in three different areas, releasing resistance, making new meaning, and then engaging and enrolling your tribe. So I mentioned before, a couple of minutes before, that the human being will always go to the behavior that feels best on the behavioral menu. We all have a certain set of choices of behaviors. And in a given context, we can either choose a behavior or we can compulsively react. We're always gonna choose the behavior that feels best. If there isn't a better feeling behavior, we're gonna choose one that feels least bad. What does this mean? If you have certain behaviors you wanna see more of in your organization, accountability, uh, innovation, taking initiative, taking ownership, higher collaboration, and if you aren't seeing those behaviors, it simply means it doesn't feel better to choose that behavior. Whatever behavior people are choosing in that place is the behavior that feels best. How do we make behaviors feel better? We're gonna learn that today. Now, thanks to Carnegie Mellon, NYU, Columbia, Stanford, Harvard, UCLA, MIT, we now know that the pathways going from the emotional brain to the intellect are like a six lane superhighway going in one direction. Whoosh, tons of data. But the pathways going from the intellect to the emotional brain are like a little tiny trail through the forest. What does this mean? This means that we are highly emotional beings. This means that we are driven and are dominated by our emotional brain. 90% of our decisions, of our behaviors are driven, are dominated by our emotional brain. We need to have an emotional strategy to understand how to help people navigate 
all the things that are coming our way on a regular basis. Short history of the brain, if you will. Three key areas of the brain. This is not a physiological rendering, it's an artistic rendering. Three key things that we want to think about in the brain. Reptilian brain, mammalian brain, and neocortex. The reptilian brain is a stimulus response machine coded for safety. It's constantly looking around saying, am I dead or not? Pure basic life support systems are run by the reptilian brain. The mammalian brain is where we have our emotional safety. And the mammalian brain, if we could speak, we say friend or foe. A little more evolved than dead or not, but still safety related, trying to make sure that we, that we are emotionally safe. Layered on top, if you will, neocortex with the prefrontal cortex right behind our forehead. The prefrontal cortex is where we have decision-making, uh, vision. I'm here, but I want to be there. What's the strategy to get there? Tool-making, language skills. But what happens when we're in situations of high stress? We, we go into what we call our critter state, which is where we are heads down, fight, flight, freeze, safe or not, dead or not. The best part of our brain, the neocortex, is unavailable. It's like it's offline. So what does this mean? This means that there's an alternative. How do we get all three parts of our brain connected all at once? We call this the smart state, where we have the reptilian, the mammalian, the neocortex, prefrontal cortex firing on all cylinders. And if we get a flame email from somebody, for instance, we say, well, that poor person is just having a bad day. We don't go into battle mode. We don't fight. We don't run away or we don't stand there and freeze. So we want to give our people the ability to navigate what happens to them more effectively because it's just good for business. The more people in their smart state, the more we have what's called a smart tribe. And you can see the high ROI, sales revenue going through the roof, greater emotional engagement, much higher personal productivity. Let's talk about how to get it. Take a moment and let's look at these two pathways. Change is the new constant. So what do we do in times of high change? Well, we have two paths. We have the critter state path and we have the smart state path. The critter state path is we see all this change and we resist it and we want to reject it. Now, resisting and rejecting takes a tremendous amount of energy, right? We're pushing against it. We're getting frustrated and then we're getting angry and then we're dismissing those new ideas and we're rejecting change outright. The alternative is we could experience that stress of change and we could consent to how we are feeling. Wow, I'm feeling kind of scared. I'm feeling kind of frustrated. When we consent, which is just be present with what's going on, instead of resist it or reject it, if we can just say, wow, this is really hard, then we can go into, huh, what's hard about it? How could it be different? We can go into curiosity, then we can go into inquiry, then we can get open-minded about it. We can get a new perspective and we can start to embrace change. Change is gonna happen regardless. The question is how do we want to feel? As leaders, we need to help our people consent and then get curious as soon as change is happening. How do we do that? We do it ourselves. We go, wow. This is really hard. I'm really overwhelmed. I'm really stressed, whatever. Then we go, okay, so what would I like here? Well, I'd like to have some new perspective. I'd like to ask a bunch of questions to see where I could go next. So what makes the difference? Emotional strategy. So clients, prospects, employees follow a path. Clients and prospects before they purchase employees during change or growth or decision-making. Understanding a person's emotional state as they walk that path is key because it helps us then accommodate and honor their emotional state so we can understand what it's like to be them. Human beings can be categorized into profiles with similar emotional experiences and key motivators. Let's talk about this today. Take just a second. Take just a second and check in. How do you feel? How do you feel? What emotional state are you in right now? 
type into chat, how are you feeling? Peaceful, powerful, joyful, what's going on for you? So let's look at what it is that we all crave. What do you crave below this emotional experience, if you will? Human beings crave three things. Once our physiological needs are met, we then crave safety, belonging, and mattering. So safety, freedom from fear, certainty, knowing somebody has our back, belonging, knowing that we have equal value. We're all in this together. We belong here. We fit in. Mattering, knowing that we are acknowledged and appreciated for our unique contributions. So let's look at this for just a sec. When we have the experience of safety, belonging, and mattering, then and only then can we get to autonomy, okay? Can we get to self-actualization? But how do you know if somebody is creating safety? Here's a decoder. If you see somebody's behavior with gossip, rumors, spreading fear maybe, talking about contingency plans, about why they can't move forward, making excuses for that, they're probably simply craving safety. We don't need to judge them. We just need to pay attention. Then we can talk with them about their concerns. We can provide a plan and a backup plan. We can tell them we have their back. We're in this together. What about if they have the behavior of isolating, of withholding information, of forming silos? They're not experiencing belonging. They're not feeling that they're together with us. So how can we help them? Tell them how happy we are that they're on the team. Talk about how we can bring people together for new projects. Bring them back into the fold. Help them understand how they fit in here. What if they are condescending, they're having behaviors of arrogance, they're shutting other people's down, they're being overly self-focused, maybe they're just craving mattering. We want to call out their strengths, we want to talk about how to help them shine and make a difference, and we want to have them lead a key initiative. So let's do a lab. Type into chat. If somebody has the behavior of fight, flight, freeze, what might they be craving? Fight, flight, freeze. And we go into so much detail on this in our book, Power Your Tribe. Yeah, they might be craving safety. Good. What if they have the behavior of us versus them? Yeah, they might be craving belonging. How about if they have the behavior of perpetually seeking recognition? What might they be craving? Yeah, mattering. Good. How about victim, complaining, whining? What might they be craving? Yeah. Thank you, Valerie. Yeah. Reassurance, here's the thing. When people are craving, when people are craving safety, belonging, or mattering, reassurance is another way of saying, hey, I don't feel safe here, okay? Victim complaining, whining, that's someone who is asking for mattering, maybe mattering and a little bit of belonging because they might not feel like they're part of the tribe. So as we start to look at people's behavior, we can stop judging it, and we can start as leaders saying, what do I need to provide so this person can actually move forward? So procrastinating is interesting because it's like two sides of the same coin. Procrastinating is on one side, perfectionism is on the other. So if we look at perfectionism and procrastinating, why isn't somebody moving forward? What might they be craving if they're procrastinating? Safety, belonging, mattering, a combination. What do you think? Well, they're procrastinating, so they're not moving forward. So they're definitely not feeling safe. What if whatever they do is wrong? Oh, my God, that would be a tragedy, right? Then they might feel like, wow, I don't matter. Because if my work's not good, then I might not be worthy. Let's look at a couple more examples of how we give this emotional experience. If we want to give somebody safety, belonging, mattering, here's how we give them safety. You're doing everything correctly. Thanks for stretching. I've got your back. Reach out to me if I can provide any sort of support, clarity, brainstorming. How about belonging? I'm so glad you're on the team. Who else could we loop in? How else can we make this a group project? Mattering, you're my top run, pick to run this project. Totally trust and appreciate you. How can I help you shine? Okay. So let's do 
a quick lab. Take a moment with all that you've learned right now and think about, hmm, think about somebody in your life. And just take a couple minutes and look at what do they crave. Think of somebody in your work or life. What do they crave in their interactions with you? Safety, belonging, or mattering? How do you know? Example, if somebody is resisting moving forward because they aren't sure how to succeed, if they're talking about all the bad stuff that could happen, they're craving safety in their experience with you. How about if they're withholding information, as I mentioned before, if they've sort of gone dark communication-wise, and ask them that they, bring, that they belong with you. It's important to reach out and bring them back in. And then how about mattering? If somebody's having the experience where they're saying, wow, nobody appreciates all the stuff I do, feeling all alone in this, that actually makes a little bit of belonging to you. But uh, I'm not feeling appreciated. I'm making all these sacrifices. That's mattering. We want to tell them, wow, you know, you're really making a difference here. Sorry, we've all been so busy. We just kind of forgot to say so. So let's look at an organization. When we have benefits programs, what experience do we give our people from benefits programs? Yeah, safety. When we have tribal rituals and celebrations, what do we create? Belonging. We're coming together. Good. When we have recognition programs like rock stars and high fives, we create feelings of what? Mattering. Yeah, because we're acknowledging and appreciating people. Individual development plans. When a person knows what their career path could be at our company, they can see how they can grow and stretch and evolve at our company. What experience does that give? Yeah. Mattering and also some safety and belonging. How about thoughtful, value-based onboarding processes? So we really bring people on board to our tribe, all three. So take a couple of minutes as you reflect on this and think about as you walk through your world, people are asking you on a regular basis to give them an emotional experience of safety, belonging, or mattering. You buy certain products or services because they give you an emotional experience of safety, belonging, or mattering. Now let's talk about thinking and what we call thinking. So what we call thinking is actually a series of pictures, of sounds, and of feelings, visuals, things that we are seeing either in memories, you see pictures in your head, right? Sounds. How many of you have actually made a mistake and said, sheesh, I can't believe I did that? You said that either externally or you say that internally. That's the sound. Feelings. You might see somebody with like a scrunched up face and you might then say, wow, um, it sounds like, it looks like they are in pain, right? So you might see that picture, say to yourself, uh-oh, or it looks like they're in pain, feel maybe crunched up, maybe shoulders tense. All this is happening really, really fast and it's happening at light speed. So let's talk about our second tool. First tool, safety, belonging, mattering. Second tool, Understanding how we make meaning. First tool, safety, belonging, mattering. It's a great way for us to help people become resilient. Because when they're resisting, we find out what they're asking for. Safety, belonging, or mattering. We give them that experience. They can then switch over to the right side. They can consent. And now we can move forward. So understanding how we experience the world is key. Sensory information pictures, sounds, etc., come into our brainstem. Then they move into our mammalian brain where feelings are attached, emotions are attached, okay? Then they move to our prefrontal cortex where we say this is good or bad. If it feels bad, then the meaning that we make is it is bad. If it feels good, then the meaning that we make is that it is good. This is how it works. So this information comes in. We get those feelings. Those feelings get translated to emotions. We then decide who we are, how the world works, etc. Let's go back to that example. We saw our boss. They had kind of a crunched up face. We then felt tense. We then felt a little bit scared, maybe. That was the emotion, was scared from the kinesthetic experience of tense, physically tense. Then maybe we decided that our boss is always disappointed with us. 
So from that meaning that we just made, our boss is always disappointed with us. We then played small. We decided to reduce our behavior, if you will, or reduce our capabilities just to keep our heads down so we didn't get in trouble. Our beliefs were, I'm not appreciated. I'm not good enough. He or she doesn't see the value I bring. And there we go. So our capabilities and our behaviors are tremendously affected by the meaning that we make. Here's some examples. If it's cold and wet, is it, oh, yuck, it's going to be hard to get to the commute? Or is it like, wee, the plants and flowers are going to be really happy? Is it the dog getting a bath going, yuck, I don't like this? Or the dog saying, wee, I get to be out in the water and this is going to be fun. The experience is the same. The difference is the feeling. What feeling do we want to create? What feeling do we want to choose based on the visuals and the auditories and the kinesthetics that are coming in? It's choice. What if the guy in the picture, let's just call him Joe, is starting a new job and his boss, his leader, is writing some things up on the whiteboard, okay? His internal experience might be, oh no, recalling visual auditory kinesthetic cues from a time in his past where his leader, his teacher, was writing up on the whiteboard. He didn't understand. She was calling on him. He felt like an idiot. Or if he had a positive experience when he was in school, he could say, woo, here I'm seeing the visuals of a woman who is in power writing on a whiteboard. This is awesome. I've got this super cool teacher. She's going to be really helpful to me today. So we store memories and then we transfer them to our current world. So take a moment, pick whichever phone image sparks an emotional response with you. Slow it down. Notice memories, visual auditory kinesthetic data. Notice which ones come to mind. What are you believing? Think about I statements, okay? And then type in to share. When you saw the child's telephone, did you hear ding, 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 the little sound that it makes when you drag it by the rope? Did you feel happy feelings and remember an experience that you had with a child? Did you see, did you hear little gurgling baby sounds? When you saw the middle phone, do you remember, did you recall the sound of dialing? Did you recall what that thing sounds like? When you saw the digital phone, did you say, oh my gosh, a lot of people when they see their phone, they load up a lot of stress because it's like, oh my gosh, here's more work. It never ends. I'm always on. I want you to start to notice the anchors, the physical anchors you have in the world and what states they create for you. Because let's talk about reframing for a moment. As a leader, we change the story. It's raining outside. This is awesome. Our reservoirs are going to be full. The drought's going to be over. The plants are going to look great. When we change the story, we change the meaning. Raining, good. this is a good thing. We change the feeling. Yay, raining. Feel good inside. Then we change the behavior. Let's. Hey, this is awesome because it's raining. This is so great. Now I get to stay late at the office and I get to have a cup of coffee with that new hire I've been wanting to get together with for two weeks. Awesome. Psyched that it's raining. I'm going to miss the traffic to boot. So a young man told me recently it's really hard to get out of fresh out of college and job hunt. And after a little while, we reframed it. It's awesome that there are a lot of people job hunting right now. It gives a person an opportunity to really bring their A game and to really stand out. The meaning is what you choose. As a leader, what meaning are you telling your people to make? So now we know that we have a choice to resist or to consent, to go into critter state or to go into smart state. We know that we can make whatever meaning we want to make. And by default, we can start to notice the sensory information that comes into our brainstem. And then we get to decide if it's good or bad. But it's a decision. One of my biggest reframes I've ever experienced in my life is my dad when he had pancreatic cancer. He had stage four pancreatic cancer. It spread throughout his body. He resisted and rejected it for quite a while. Then one day he was ready to consent. 
and to reframe the experience. And he said that cancer was one of the best things that ever happened to him. And when I asked him why, he said because it had helped him open his heart. And he would rather live fewer years or months at that point with an open heart than to live a bunch of decades with a closed one. Needless to say, the last few months of his life were amazing. We can reframe anything, even something as potent as cancer. So let's come back then to safety, belonging, mattering, and to understand what our people are feeling. So if you look at the screen, you'll see one of our tools called the SBM Index. And the SBM Index, Safety, Belonging, Mattering Index, is a way to gauge how people are doing in our company and how they're feeling. You'll see vertically, we have different departments, okay? Admin, investments, marketing, operations. This is a client from the past of ours. And I want you to see this and notice we use the heat map format because it helps us very quickly realize where we have work to do. So the first three questions are safety, the next three are belonging, the next three are mattering. Then we have a net promoter. So empower your tribe, we show you how to walk through this. And of course we do consulting and coaching to help folks go through how do we then take the findings and change our culture. But let's look at this for a sec. Once you find out what emotional experience people want in your company, and of course you look at the individual questions, that tells you where you need to work. Then you can create a cultural game plan. We talk about this in chapter seven and eight, Empower Your Tribe. When you create a cultural game plan, you're actually looking at creating the emotional experiences that are missed. So for example, if, some, if the guys in the investments department want more belonging, we're gonna put cultural programs in place that are gonna give them the experience of belonging. If folks in the admin department want more safety, we're gonna be putting programs in place that will give them more safety. So we put all these cultural programs in place. You'll notice across the bottom, cultural game plans take many, many months because once we get those SPM index results, we need to put programs in place. We need to give them some time to do their work. Then we can retake the SPM index and we'll notice that emotional engagement and employee engagement has increased. So let's look at how we can create this in your company. Start thinking about your questions, guys. Start thinking about your questions. What questions do you want to ask so that we can help your team become more emotionally resilient? What questions do we want to ask so we can help your people navigate growth and change more effectively? When we use these tools, we then are able to help people have a richer experience. And when we go back to Q&A, I'll be happy to pop to whatever slide we need to pop to to get to that experience, okay? So, Let's take a moment and let's think about what did we learn today? And then let's take some questions. We can add more and better feeling choices to our and our team's behavioral menus by using safety, belonging, mattering. We must know what they are craving since it drives their behavior. Think about why you buy what products or services you buy. If you use Federal Express, why do you use FedEx versus the U.S. mail? Perhaps for the experience of safety, when you know for sure, totally, that it's going to get there? Why would somebody drive a BMW versus any car that would get them from point A to point B? That BMW possibly gives them an experience of mattering. What experiences do people want in their interactions with you? in their interactions with your company. Reframing, we can choose the meaning that we want to make, whichever meaning is most empowering. Remember the epic reframe example I gave you from my dad, right, around reframing cancer. One of our clients was going through this huge challenge where they were in Latin America, they had currencies collapsing, they had crazy dictators, they had supply chains breaking up, and they could have gotten really freaked out because it was impacting their revenue. Instead, they said, this is great. What we get to do is we get to figure out new supply chains. 
We get to meet new relationships and suppliers. We need to expand into new markets. We need to try new marketing approaches. This is awesome. They reframed that challenge as something that brought people together. SBM index and game plan. When we diagnose where the trouble is, where we're missing safety, belonging, mattering, if you will, and we know exactly where, then you can work with us. You guys can figure it out on your own to empower your tribe. Then we can look at what are all the programs we need to put in place to help people actually have a different emotional experience. When we put those new programs in place, we then find emotional engagement, employee engagement increases. So we diagnose where the trouble is, then we transform that stress or disengagement into power. So in a moment, we're going to do a poll. Would you like to get more information from Smart Tribes? If you say yes, Smart Tribes is our company. We'll send you the replay link from today's webinar. We'll make sure that we send you the slides from today's webinar. And then we'll send you some resources from the tools that we mentioned in today's webinar. So take a moment, please, and type in whether you would like to receive, you can just click with your mouse, more info from our company. And we'll give you a couple of minutes to do this, or maybe just a minute or so, because I know there's a little delay. So when we understand, when we understand how we're going to help people navigate most effectively, then we can help our people perform at new levels. Here's what I want to make sure we understand. Your people will perform at the level that you help them perform at. That is how powerful you are. Please start typing your questions into the question box. So people can choose a different behavioral experience. They can choose more options. You can actually edit their behavioral menu and provide them with more choices. This is how awesome this stuff is. So as we use these tools, as we start to understand that human beings' behavior is 90% driven by their emotional brain, then we can use our 10% to help people's emotional state become better feeling, better feeling emotional state, better results. Good. Let's take a couple of questions. Please grab your copy of Power Your Tribe so you can learn more about these cool tools that we taught you today. We start to think about safety, belonging, and mattering. Start to look at all the things in your life that you can reframe. And also start to think about what emotional experience do I want to intentionally create for people? And then what are they asking me for? If you go to smarttribesinstitute.com slash strategy, you can get a strategy session with us where we can walk through whatever your particular challenges are and we can tell you which tools will be most helpful. Okay, great. So please type in um, whatever's easiest for you. There's the question box. I know a lot of you guys are using chat. You can use chat as well. Please type in your questions. We'll take a few questions and then we will go off into the afternoon. What would you like to know? How would you like to apply this to your own tools and your own situations? How would you like to apply these tools to your own challenges? I'll fill in with a couple questions while you guys are typing yours into chat. And then I know that um, Courtney will be reading them out. Type into chat or type into the question box. So a lot of people say to me, how do we actually help everybody in the company understand what everybody else wants? There's nothing sneaky or secret about these tools. We want to talk openly about the emotional experience that we're providing to our people, to our customers, to our employees. So one thing that's really fun is to get everybody together and to say, when you look out at our company, at our customers, why do they work with us? What do they get from working with us? Is it safety? Are they coming to us for safety? If so, use more safety messages in your marketing. Are they coming to us so they can belong and fit in? If so, use more belonging messages. Are they coming to us to matter so they can achieve their goals? If so, use more in your marketing mattering type messages. 
You'll learn about safety, belonging, mattering in Chapter 2. You'll also learn about meta programs in Chapter 7 of Power Your Tribe. We use those very powerfully in sales and marketing scenarios where we want people to really connect deeply with their prospects and also to navigate conflict and change. In a conflict scenario, ask a person what they would like. They probably will tell you what they would not like. So once they list all the things they would not like, then look at what the positive alternative is for them. That positive alternative will then help you understand what they do like. So if someone says, I don't want so much stress and so much uncertainty, you could say, well, then what would the opposite of stress and uncertainty be? Well, I want some certainty and I want more peace. Ah, good. Certainty and more peace. Great. So what would that look like? How can I help you create that? And now you're off to the races because you just recognize that they wanted certainty and more peace, which is pretty big safety messaging. And now you're going to help them create that. Courtney, what do we have? Shall we, uh, shall we wrap or do we have some questions from folks? We do have a few questions. Um, one just came in about how they can empower their team in an environment of layoffs and uncertainty. Ooh, okay, thank you. So in layoffs and uncertainty, um, what we wanna do is we wanna also look at how we can honor the legacy. So for example, um, we, we always explain, we don't just do layoffs without talking about it. So, um, the world is changing, for instance, our company is moving forward in order to adapt and shift to these new climates. We are having to pivot on our business model. This does mean that certain roles will have to be removed. Let's look at those roles and how they've helped us get to where we are. We want to honor those roles. Grieving does happen in a company when layoffs occur, for sure. We want to honor those roles. We want to celebrate the contribution that those people have made. And we want to actually have a ritual, you know, a party or whatever, you know, some cake, a way to celebrate and thank those people and send them off to their new adventure with an experience of you were part of this tribe. You made a difference to this tribe. Thank you so much for helping us come to this stage. When we do that with honor and respect and valuing people, then it's easier to have the grieving process happen. And it's okay to grieve at work. We have to let that happen. But when we all come together, belonging, to talk about all the things we're going to put in place so we can navigate a little more safely, so we can all matter in the future, and we can honor the mattering of the folks that have been here before, it just helps us have a more smooth emotional transition. Thank you for that question. And we have another one. How can I reframe my boss won't give me a raise? Oh, <laughs> okay. Boss won't give me a raise. Um, okay, here's, I've got one for you. Um, it's awesome that my boss hasn't yet agreed to give me a raise because it's helping me see that there's probably a lot of cool ways that I can show my boss my value. So I'm going to start on a regular basis showing my boss all the cool, valuable things that I do, whatever, each week, each month, the key accomplishments I've had to date at the company, and make it fun. Say, you know what? I get it, boss. I get that there's not an opportunity for a raise right, right now, but I'm going to do a better job of keeping you in the loop. And I want to show you all the ways I'm adding value. And please let me know if there are more ways I can add value that you're not seeing here. Because I want to be one of the best folks that's ever worked with you before. So I'm going to start communicating more about the value that I'm bringing. And please give me feedback because I want to be awesome for you. And we can make it fun like that. That's a belonging. That's a safety. That's a mattering. I want to be so awesome for you because a boss maybe, maybe hasn't given a raise yet because the boss hasn't seen your value. We want the boss to have an experience of good feelings, you. Good feelings, you. When they've attached good feelings in you and value, you will get a raise. This is a cool opportunity to communicate more effectively your value. Thank you. And we have one last question. Um, if the office is an extremely busy place, how can I make time for powering my tribe? Ah, uh, okay. So if your office is extremely busy, here are a couple of super fun things you can do. 
everybody has to eat, really. And if they're not eating, then that's a whole separate problem, okay? <laughs> Gather them together, have them bring their food, go to the PowerYourTribe.com website, sign in. You'll see that you guys can have your books and it can be kind of a lunch and learn. We have videos for many of the chapters. That's what you guys can do. You can just get together with your food and invest 10, 15, 20 minutes, maybe do it every Friday or do it Friday at four o'clock when people are tired anyway. Come together, belonging, right? To learn some new tools so you'll be more safe, so everybody can matter, and use the videos on the Power Your Tribe website. That's a really easy way to kind of do it yourself and get started. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Christine. This was a really great webinar. And I just want to make sure that everyone gets their Power Your Tribe. Yeah, grab your Power Your Tribe, you guys. Go to smarttribesinstitute.com slash strategy if you want to see how we can possibly work with you guys to help you out. And um, you'll be hearing more cool stuff from us. So thank you so much for your time, everybody.